Okay, here we go. All right, what's the stomach mostly made out of? Muscle, right? And what are the two things muscle can do? All right? So, and remember, every distinct section of the GI tract is separated by a circular band of muscle called a sphincter. That's a good word. I think that's the word, sphincter. If you see a security guard, say sphincter, you'll get money. All right? Not a lot. Okay. So watch. There are three specialized cells inside the lining that make up the lining of the stomach. Number one, you have goblet cells. And what do goblet cells secrete? Mucus. mucus. And that mucus coats the inside of the stomach. And it's also rich in a base called bicarbonate, HCO3 negative. HC, that's bicarbonate. And you learned in chemistry, and I'll never forget it, that acids and bases do what to one another? They neutralize one another. So bicarbonate is a base, right? And you, we're going to learn in a second that the second type of cell in the lining of the stomach are called parietal cells. And parietal cells, they secrete hydrochloric acid, right? So the pH of the stomach is very, very low because there's a lot of free-floating hydrogen ions. So the pH is like 1 to 2, very, very acidic. So, And the reason that the hydrochloric acid doesn't erode the lining of the stomach in most conditions is because you have that mucus that's produced by goblet cells that's rich in bicarbonate. Say yeah. So when you're about to eat something, right, you think about eating or the act of eating, goblet cells will begin to produce that protective mucus lining. Tell me you're following this. All right. So I'm just going to show you this just real quick. When you get into advance, you're going to have to learn this. Oh, look at that. There's chemistry in there, right? So on that day, I bring everybody a Valium. <laughs> all right, this is all I want to show you. This is a parietal cell. How do you know it's a parietal cell? It says parietal cell. Now, and then this is the lumen of the stomach. So this is right here. Now watch. There is a pump in the cell membrane of parietal cells called a proton pump. What are hydrogen ions? Protons. Protons. So watch. If you Don't write this down. Don't write any of this down. Just listen to this. In advance, you'll be required to know this. There are pumps that pump hydrogen ions into the stomach. What's another name for a hydrogen ion? A proton. So these are called proton pumps. Tell me you got that. So if you produce a lot of acidity in your stomach, a doctor will prescribe you Nexium. Prilosec, Prevacid, Protonics. And those are proton pump inhibitors. PPI, have you ever heard of them? Proton pump inhibitors? Have you heard of those? Right? Next, the purple pill. And how they work is by inhibiting the proton pump in parietal cells. Say yes. That is, of course, beautiful. Parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid. That's what you have to know right now. And then finally, you have chief cells. And chief cells, they produce an enzyme called pepsin. That's a bad color. Pepsin helps digest protein. So you better write this down. The nutrient that is digested in the stomach 
is protein. That's why if you get sick and you had, I don't know, some raviolios, when you throw that up, that meat is partially digested because the hydrochloric acid and pepsin will digest that protein. Now watch. Pepsin is also the active ingredient in meat tenderizers. So if you have a steak and you put a little pepsin on there, little, what is it, Adolf's meat tenderizer or whatever it is, if you don't have any meat tenderizer in your cupboard, you can just throw up on your steak. <laughs> And that'll tenderize it. That's for real. Tell me you got that. Okay. So those are the three unique types of cells that are found in the stomach. Yep. And what's the primary nutrient that's digested in the stomach? Boom. And you better know the parts of the stomach, too. What's the top part of any hollow muscular organ called? No. Come on. You've had a, how many people have had babies? Nobody. <laughs> when they go to, when you go to your OBGYN and they measure from your symphysis pubis to the top of your uterus, they're measuring what? I don't know anything about kids, and I know this. What are they measuring? No. They're measuring the fundus or the fundal height. Did, you didn't know that? No. Oh. You never heard that before. The top part of any hollow muscular organ is called the fundus. Is the stomach a hollow muscular organ? Say yeah. <laughs> so what's the top part of the stomach called? See? And now look, you got this little curvature here. That's called the lesser curvature of the stomach. Then you got the big curvature here. What do you think that is? Just spitball here. Come on. Yeah, see, you're bringing your A game today. That's the greater curvature, lesser curvature. Now watch. The vast majority of the stomach, this area right here, is called the body of the stomach. Now, as you can see, look. Are you looking? What happens to the stomach as you move deeper into the stomach? What happens to it? It begins to narrow, yes? So this narrowed area is called the pyloric canal. You got me? And then watch. The end of the stomach pyloric canal, and then there is a circular band of muscle that separates the stomach from the first part of the small intestines called the duodenum. And that circular band of muscle is called the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter. Now, is it normal for a six-month-old to burp up is it normal for your 18-year-old to burp up? Like at graduation when you burp them. Is it normal for them to burp up? That's because it takes about a year for this lower esophageal sphincter muscle to tighten up. So babies under a year of age, it's normal for them to burp up. You got me? After that, they shouldn't be burping up. Your kids shouldn't, you know, 8-year-olds shouldn't be burping up, you know, their french fries. But there is a pathologic condition where this pyloric sphincter gets really, really tight, and it won't allow food that's in the stomach to get into the duodenum. And if you can't move food this way, food will move the other way. You got me? So you get this projectile vomiting. Projectile vomiting in a kid is always pathologic. There's something wrong. Tell me you got burping up, no problem. Fire hose vomit coming out of you, you get their kid to the emergency, something's wrong with that kid. Say yes. And if the kid's head 
turns all the way around, you're in big trouble. Yeah, call a friend. Call a cop. Yeah, set them up for adoption. Tell me uh, you followed this, right? So uh, one of the things that's going to happen, especially in um, newborns, is they'll get a condition called pyloric stenosis. And what they do is they actually stick a tube down the kid, and they will actually balloon that pyloric muscle open so it stretches out so that food will get into the duodenum. Say, yeah. Okay, so here we go. Now, whoops, hang on. Write this down. Depending on what you eat, and know this, fat makes your stomach fuller longer. The more fat that's in your diet, the longer food stays in your stomach. And the longer food stays in your stomach, the longer you feel full. That's why fat food makes you feel fuller longer. You eat an authentic Chinese meal, a couple hours later you're hungry again. That's because that food is relatively low in fat and it leaves the stomach quickly. Say yes. And we, you better write this down. The stomach has these little nerve endings that detect pressure. What are they called? Oh, okay, good. They're called, whoops, they're called bear, bear O receptors. Bear O receptors. What do bear O receptors recept? Pressure. So when you eat a bunch of food, what's going to happen to the amount of food in your stomach? It's going to go up. So the pressure, whoops. The pressure in your stomach is going to increase, and that's going to stimulate barrel receptors in your stomach, and that's going to send a signal to your hypothalamus saying you are full. That's why when people go on diets, the number one constant common denominator in all diets is drinking, drink lots of water. Because when you add water to the stomach, it will stretch it, and it will send a signal to your brain saying, okay, I'm full. Now, obviously, it doesn't last that long, but it does help a little bit. Say yes. Now, know this. The body does stuff that makes sense. So if you are a big eater, you can actually overstretch the stomach where it will be four or five times its normal size. And when you overstretch that stomach, barrel receptors will not be stimulated until you put a ton of food into that stomach. That's why people who are overweight, their stomach actually gets stretched out and they have to fill it up before they actually feel full. So when they do gastric bypass, they do just that. They, take, they hack off the esophagus then they leave a little pouch right here and they bypass the stomach and they connect the esophagus to this little pouch of the pyloric canal. And now that little pouch is so small you can only eat like thimbles full of food. And that's how these people lose weight. The problem with that is, is that the body does stuff that makes sense. And over a few years you can actually stretch that little pouch out where these people will actually gain the weight back that they lost. Yeah, that sucks. And know this, and I think I told you this, right? I don't care what anybody says. Everybody's got their thing. Do you know what I'm talking about? That kind of grabs a hold of you, right? And in people who um, have a weight problem, you can see it. But everyone got that little thing that can take them down a bad path. Me, it's making videos for my class. Tell me you followed this. You got this. Okay. Now, I'm going to explain to you now the small intestines. The small intestines, you better write this down. The small intestines are made up of three parts. The first part is a duodenum. Then you have the largest part called the 
jejunum. And then you have the final, like one-third, called the ileum. So the three parts of the small intestines, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. And this is really important. In the small intestines, that is where the vast majority of digestion and absorption of nutrients occurs. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So anytime you have problems with your small intestines, your ability to digest and absorb nutrients is going to be impaired. Say yeah. Okay. Now, a couple of things, and you should write these down. A couple of things about the small intestines. They are, it's like a tube, a tube of smooth muscle. Right? Smooth muscle. And muscle. And the small intestines go through peristaltic waves about 20 to 30 times a day. So when you think you hear your stomach rumbling, what you really hear is the movement of fluid and food, partially digested food, in your small intestines. 20 to 30 times a day. Right? And the small intestines, the small intestines are about 21 feet long. The large intestines are about 7 feet long. So you have a total of about 28 feet of intestine. Tell me you got that. Where does the vast majority of digestion absorption of nutrients occur? In the GI tract? Small intestines. Yep. And now watch, and I'll go into more of this. After you digest and absorb the stuff into the blood, the small intestines move into the large intestines. And the small, the large intestines are larger in diameter than the small intestines. Do you want your large intestines contracting 20 to 30 times a day? No, because you wouldn't get anything done. I got to go. I got to go. So when you got diarrhea, they are contracting all the time. Tell me you got that. And watch. Know this. And I think I told you this. Anytime you irritate the lining of the large intestines, that stimulates peristalsis. So Exlax and Correctol, yeah, those irritate the lining of the large intestines. That's what causes you to poop. Tell me you got that. So when you get a flu virus, you get an intestinal flu virus, it produces toxins that irritate your colon and you all the time. Say, yeah. Do you want to do that? No. You get that where it comes out of you like a jet fighter. Right? You're like, bam, like you lift off. <laughs> you ever have that? That's awful. Okay. Now watch, I'll show you more about this in a minute. But the large intestines don't have a lot of muscle. What they have are these little bands of muscle. And then as you can see, the little bands of muscle kind of reach out. And that's what causes the segmentation of the large intestines. And the large intestines normally only go through peristaltic waves about two to three times a day. Did I ask this question of you? Um, what's fiber? What's fiber? Come on. What's fiber? Okay. Wait. How many people go to uh, picnics in the summer? Cora, do you go to a picnic in the summer? Yeah. See? She does. I don't. Anyways. If you eat corn on the cob, 
couple days later, right, you'll be taking care of business, and you're like, I don't remember eating that. Watch. Fiber is not digestible by the human digestive tract. So the way it comes in is the way it leaves. Say yeah. And watch, and I'll talk more about this as we get there. In the large intestines, the more stuff that ends up in the large intestines, the more frequently it contracts. So if you can't digest it, it ends up in the large intestines. More stuff in your large intestines, the more frequently they contract. That's how fiber works as a laxative. Say yes. And that's why fiber doesn't have any calories. Because if you can't digest it, you can't use it for energy inside your cell. So eat corn all day. Just don't put any butter on it or anything. Just eat that. What, corn? Yeah. Why? No, that's fiber. That's good for you. Yeah, you like corn? I don't like, ooh. It just looks nasty. Or peas? Peas are the worst thing ever. Okay? How many people followed this? All right? So that's why they tell you to eat fiber and read the textbook. If you read the textbook regularly, you will become more regular. And not only that, you should read it while you're taking care of your business, right? Oh, yeah, there's the left clavichord. How could I forget? All right, here we go. I'm going to explain more about that in a minute. This is what I want to explain to you, and this is the important part. And I'm not a huge anatomy person. I'm more physiology, right, clearly. But I'm going to explain to you now why understanding a little bit of anatomy is critical to your understanding some of the pathophysiology of the digestive tract. Are you ready? All right, watch. This is where the rubber meets the road. These are the three accessory organs of digestion that are intimately involved in digestion. One, the liver. Two, the gallbladder. What's the definition of a bladder? Oh, that's so close. A hollow muscular organ. So what's the gallbladder? A hollow muscular organ. Say yes. Okay. So... Now watch, watch. You have the gallbladder, and as you can clearly see, the gallbladder and the liver are connected together by these little tubes called ducts. Are you with me? Then you can see that the pancreas and the gallbladder and the liver all dump their contents into the duodenum from the same spot. Do you see this? Right here. So the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas are connected. And the connection, oops, is what's called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Oh, I'll write that down for you. Hepato pancreatic ampulla. An ampulla is an opening. You got me? So this is the hepato pancreatic ampulla. Do you see this? This area right here. It's actually named after a guy called, uh, it's called the ampulla of Vader. Maybe that's a little easier to remember because it looks like a V. See? Vader. <laughs> no? All right, fine. Be that way. 
All right, this is what I want you to get. One of the things that you're going to have to understand, especially when you're caring for people with GI problems, liver, gallbladder, pancreatic problems, is that if they have liver problems, that can lead to gallbladder and pancreatic problems. If they have pancreatic problems, that can lead to gallbladder and liver problems. You see where I'm going with this. Tell me you got that. So one of the things that you have to understand, and I'll explain this in a minute, is if this little ampulla is blocked, it can have profound effects on your liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. Tell me you got that. So what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to explain to you the functions of these different organs. And this is, you need to know this. I'm telling you this right now. And then I'll explain to you clinically why it's critical that you understand some of this stuff, yes? So the first thing I'm going to explain to you is the function of the liver. This is what your liver looks like. And just so you know, um, I got a digestive tract from a, I think it's from a pig, and I'll, um, I'll bring it in, a fresh one, and then I'll show it to you. Um, your liver and everyone's liver is actually numbered, so the doctors will know, like, that's the gallbladder. <laughs> so stupid. God. I listen to this sometimes, and I can't believe I say this stuff. There we go. I'm going to go over with you the functions of the liver. Are you ready? The liver is a badass. Please get this. I'm not going to write it down because it's too long. You're going to write it down. Everything that you put into your pie hole, everything, everything that gets Broken down by your GI tract and absorbed into the blood goes through the liver first. Everything. Okay, and this is what I'm willing to do for you, and this is no joke. If you get a fake tattoo of this, a fake tattoo, doesn't even have to be real, of this, I'll give you extra credit, not even plain, right? All the veins of the GI tract And write this down. All the nutrients from your GI tract is absorbed into the venous blood first. The venous blood first. And all the veins of your GI tract meet at one big vein that enters your liver. And that big vein that enters your liver is called the hepatic portal vein. Hepatic portal vein. All the nutrients get digested and absorbed into the venous end of the blood of the GI tract. Are you with me? And where do all the veins of the GI tract meet? At the portal vein. So watch. All the blood from your GI tract, goes to the liver first. Is there any pressure in your veins? No. You better, oh, you better believe in this. This will explain a lot. Tell me you got that. That's very important that you get that. So one of the big functions of the liver, huge function, big one, is to detoxify everything that you put into your pie hole. Do you put bad stuff into your mouth? Probably every day, right? We don't want to talk about it. 
So if you take, like, there's chemicals in the food that you eat, right? You don't want that stuff floating around in your blood, right? So all of that stuff that gets digested and absorbed goes to the liver first, and there are enzymes that break down and detoxify that stuff. Say yes, you got that. And once that blood is detoxified and filtered, yes, it leaves the liver through the hepatic vein. And the hepatic vein then dumps that detoxified, filtered blood into the right atrium. Who's following me? Right? So it detoxifies. Here's the other thing it does. It makes, number two, cholesterol. Yeah? What are your cholesterols? You got three different types of cholesterol. What are they? And the ugly. Wah, wah, wah. Right? You have HDL, LDL, and VLDL. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Or H, happy, L, lousy, and VLDL, very lousy. The liver manufactures cholesterol. The other thing that the liver does, and you should know this, right? Number three is it stores glycogen. Some of you who got the functions of glucagon and insulin, you got glycogen and glucagon and glucose. Yeah, yep. It was all messed up. Glycogen. I got it messed up too, look. It stores glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose, yes? All right. Number four. Number four, makes, makes blood clotting factors. There's a bunch of blood clotting factors. The liver makes about eight essential blood clotting factors. Yes? It also makes the big protein, the big freaking protein, Right? Albumin. That's big. It's so big. It's big. Albumin in normally should only be found in the blood. It's so big. You got me? Albumin. A-L-B. Big. You got albumin in your urine? Something's wrong with you. You get albumin on the stove? Something's wrong with you. Get albumin in the seat? Something's wrong with you. You're with me? Okay. The other thing that the liver does is it stores fat-soluble vitamins. If you take a bunch of vitamin C, vitamin C is water-soluble, and you pee a real bright yellow urine. That's because it's water-soluble. The fat-soluble vitamins can get, actually get stored in the liver and cause hypervitaminosis. So don't be taking those vitamins. Read the textbook. And the fat-soluble vitamins are D, E, A, and K. Those are the fat-soluble vitamins. Yeah? Ready? So think of DEEK. Like Tim's a DEEK. Wouldn't be the worst thing. Okay, watch. I explained this to you before. I'm going to explain it to you again. This is really important. Ready? You better get this right. How long do red blood cells live? 120 days. Oh, if you don't get, I, I quit. What's the big protein inside a red blood cell? That's beautiful. What's embedded in the hemoglobin? Good. Watch. Next semester I'm going to ask you that and you'll be like, what? What? Right? Tell me you got that. Okay, now watch. 
Now we're done with that. When a red blood cell dies, there's for this class, there's two places they can go. One of them is the liver, and the other is the spleen. You got me? The spleen is on the opposite side of the liver. And in young people, the spleen makes and destroys red blood cells. So if you jack up your spleen when you're a kid, they try to save it. In an adult, they just yank it out. So when a red blood cell dies, like at day 119, Grandpa, bye kids, see you later. They go to the liver and the first thing that happens is the red blood cell membrane is ruptured. You with me? Now you've exposed the protein hemoglobin. And in the liver of the spleen, there are enzymes that will begin to break down that hemoglobin. And you're not going to believe what they do. That enzyme breaks it down to heme and glo Did I go over this? Did I? I'm going to go over it again. You're going to get this, right? And the heme portion is then broken down to iron and what? A good thing I'm going over it again. And bilirubin. What color is bilirubin? Yellow. Yellow. And the globin, that is converted, those are broken down to amino acids, and they're converted to glucose or fat. Now watch. The bilirubin then in the liver, the bilirubin goes to the liver, and that bilirubin is then converted to bile. in the liver. And bile, better write this down, bile contains bilirubin, bile salts, salts, yep, and you're not going to believe this one, cholesterol. Yeah? And when the liver makes the bile, watch it. When the liver makes that bile, that bile, so where did you make the bile? In the liver. That bile is then dumped from the liver and it gets stored in the gallbladder. So the function of the gallbladder is simply to store bile and to dehydrate it. So the gallbladder dehydrates it. So the concentration of bile in the gallbladder is much higher than the concentration of bile that's produced by the liver. The bile that's produced by the liver is watered down. Bile in the gallbladder, concentrated. What's bile made out of? And? And? Cholesterol. Watch. Real quick. I saved another teacher's life about five or six years ago. Again. Anyways, this lady, uh, she just retired a couple years ago. She was going to her office. I'm going to teach class, right? And she goes, Tim, I was in the emergency room uh, uh, last night. I go, for what? She goes, I was, thought I was having a heart attack. I go, were you? No, they did a EKG on blood work, and they told me to ambulate home. And I go, when you go up to your office, call your doctor and tell me you want an ultrasound of your gallbladder. You have um, gallstones. Because I asked her, when did you eat? She goes, about 6.30. I go, when did you end up going to the emergency room? About 7.30. I'm like, and she had four of the five Fs. She was female. Fat, 40, fair skin, and I didn't ask about the fertile part. So 
women who have the five F's are at greater risk for gallbladder disease. So I don't see her. I don't see her. And at our in-service, she goes, Tim, you were right. I'm having my gallbladder out in uh, three days. She goes, how did you know? And I told her about the five F's. She probably thought you were going to say something. Right, like, yeah, explain this up to her. I go, no, you had the four of the five F's. I didn't ask the other one. But um, watch. And this is important that you get this. When you cut yourself, you don't have to look to see where you cut yourself, right? That's because pain fibers are close together in your skin. In your guts, the pain fibers are spread out. And a lot of times, abdominal pain or chest pain can be referred, meaning you're having gallbladder pain. When is that the right time? Yeah. yeah, okay. You're having gallbladder pain, but it will be referred to the epigastric area, so people think they're having a heart attack. Tell me you, you follow that. And the pain tends to not be real, like it tends to be diffuse or spread out because the pain fibers are spread out. Tell me you got that. All right? So, <clears throat> but here's the weird thing about that. An ER doc couldn't figure that one out. Because you know what they do? They have a smartphone and they type in symptoms and it gives them a flow chart as this is what it might be and this is what you need to do. That's no joke, yep. Right. Right. There you go. There you go. Right, right. And um, they can't figure that out. They can't figure that out. That's why you need to know this. You need to know this anatomy stuff, this part right here. Tell me you got that. Now watch. Why are women at greater risk for the development of gallbladder disease? What's in bile? What's in it? Cholesterol. And estrogen, that's why they got to be fertile. If you're fertile, you're still producing estrogen. That dumps a ton of cholesterol into your bile. And when you dump a ton of cholesterol into your bile, it forms stones. That's what the stones are. They're calcium and cholesterol. So don't get that. And the best way to not get gallstones is what? What? What is it? Yeah. You know what? You guys got it rough, man. You know what I mean? That's hard. No, I'll read the textbook. That reduces your risk for the gallbladder. I'm not even playing. Now, watch. Write this down. The function of bile is to, it's the dawn dish detergent of your body. It gets grease out of your way. Bile emulsifies fat. emulsifies fat. What does that mean? I don't even know. Watch. Bile does this. You eat a big fat glob, gets into your duodenum, bile comes in and breaks up these big, the big fat glob into little fat globs. Which has more surface area? The big fat glob or a bunch of little fat globs? Say a bunch of little fat globs. So did you, did you ever hear of a drug called um, Allied? You've heard of it? Allied was a bile acid sequestrant. People would take this, it would bind bile, so they couldn't emulsify fat. And if you can't emulsify fat, you can't digest it very good. And if you can't digest it, you can't absorb it into your blood. So you get fatty Poop. Remember Olestra, right? It'll cause anal leakage at Olestra potato chips, but you couldn't digest them. Do you remember this? What's that? What was that? Yeah. So you, and basically it binds bile. So anything that binds bile 
will prevent you from digesting fat properly. And if you can't digest it, you can't absorb it. Say yes. Okay. All right, take a break, huh? Like uh, like 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes, okay? Yeah, dude, you're right just in time. And I hope this thing works. Oh, yeah, uh, turn in your multiple guests, huh? Thanks. in here today to like I'm allergic to something because it's bothering me I know I wonder what it is you too yeah yeah and I keep oh man is it is it you no there's something in it yeah I don't know what it is is anybody else doing like itching and oh Yeah, I know. I saw you. I, I saw your little eyes start puffing up, too. Can you go to that other slide really quick where you have chemo and globin and a pretty picture of the... I just want to write it down here. Yeah, that's what you can do. Where did I put that? Oh, here. Isn't that pretty? Oh, yeah. That's so pretty. Did I explain to you why babies get jaundice? Mm-hmm. See, now you know. Isn't that cool? Well, right. Have no, no, that's not why they get jaundice. They break it down, but fetal hemoglobin is different than people hemoglobin. So when the kid starts breathing... They have to get rid of their fetal hemoglobin. So sometimes the little liver gets overwhelmed. That's why they get jaundice. Did that make sense? Yeah, right. Or they tell them to take them out, take them out and put them in the sun a little bit. Yeah, there's something in here. You guys are... Something... Who's got cats? Oh. An associate degree. Yes. No, no. A four-year degree is you have a, you you take all these um, other um, prerequisite classes, you know, like your psychology. And there's for a bachelor's degree, there's more 
uh, there's more science classes you have to take. Like I had to take um, two semesters of general, or you know, uh, inorganic chemistry. Then I had to take a semester of biochemistry, organic chemistry. Then um, I had to take uh, uh, three semesters of uh, anatomy and physiology. Yeah, and then a pathophysiology class. Then I got to go into clinical along with your uh, uh, psychology, developmental psychology, and abnormal psychology. You know, you had to take all those. Yes, and watch. Yeah, here's the thing. Like, if I had to do it all over again, I would have come to Gateway. I would have got my associate's degree, worked as a nurse, and, and then had the hospital pay for my bachelor's degree. Because the, they're hiring associate degree nurse, but you have like five years to complete your bachelor's degree. And because, you know, the baby boomers, Timmy, are getting older now, um, there's going to be a lot more older people who are getting sick. So they don't want to say, look, we don't want ADN nurses anymore because they need nurses. So what they're willing to do is you can get your degree and then you have five years um, in order to um, uh, complete it. Yeah. Yeah, watch. And they don't care. Uh, most hospitals don't care. All they want to know is that you have RM behind your name because what that means is that they don't they don't care that you um, um, you have an associate or bachelor's. What they care about is that you have RM behind your name because they assume that you know how to start an IV or give a shot or you know what I mean. Those are that's what they want. From Gateway, yeah, the um, Gateway. Once they raised up the stakes where you had to have a like a B in this class and a B in the advanced class, um, it it dropped to like they were getting like ninety two percent pass rate of all the students. Now they're back up to like ninety ninety four ninety five ninety six where they want to be. But for for most of the students, um, if they get through the program, they pass it. And I have not had one student uh, who's taken my classes who's got through clinical, who have not passed the NCLEX on the first try. Yeah. And the, the, the students will always let me know, Timmy, I passed the uh, NCLEX. And I say, of course you did. <laughs> There's something goofy in here. Can you, is there something like smelling bad in here? I don't smell nothing. I'm just itching everywhere. Oh my god! What is that? A pop tart? Oh. I, huh? I don't know. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know. It, it's not up to me.